Hi guys! Well, welcome to chapter four of Peruvian Plunge as we uh, closed out chapter three. I was uh, mentioning this primitive flute that my Stone Age Indian buddy Marino was playing as I drifted off to sleep. And uh, that's going to be the focus of this short chapter titled Hambone Buys a Pagombi. P-E-G-O-M-B-I, I guess. Uh, <clears throat> but we're going to start off with a quote from Joseph Conrad in the Heart of Darkness <clears throat> from 1902. Quote, the conquest of the earth, which mostly means taking it away from those who have a different complexion or slightly flatter noses than ourselves, is not a pretty thing when you look into it too much. So we are now up to Monday, May 25th, 2009, outside of Atalaya, Peru. <clears throat> Monday morning broke gray and chilly in the rainforest with increasingly heavy spats of rain blowing up the river canyon. A general weather pattern that would hold for the next nine dreary days. After warming my innards with a breakfast of potatoes and coffee, I retreated to my hammock to curl up with a good book, Amazon Stranger by Mike Tidwell. Every muscle in my body was sore from Sunday's drubbing, and it was, in fact, the first real day of rest I had been able to enjoy since leaving Costa Rica ten days earlier. The nicest benefit of the soggy weather was that it chased the weekend lumberjacks back to where they came from. I was still lounging in my hammock several hours later when a brief break in the clouds presented me with the opportunity to defy the advice of every jungle guidebook author and go fill my water jug from a nearby mountain stream. Besides the canister of propane, another voluntary oversight I had made in Atalaya in my overzealous, des overzealous desire to live like an Oreo munching Stone Age Indian was the, was the decision not to bring any drinking water with me. Instead, I had elected to boil my drinking water. Marino, of course, drank directly from the kitchen faucet. But after two days and nights of drinking smoky water, I longed for a long chug of agua dulce, sweet water, direct from the bosom of Mother Nature. For once, the overworked Marino opted to take over hammock guarding duty while I headed off into the jungle, alone at last, for my hour-long round trip to collect a bottle of drinking water and damn good drinking water, too, I might add. Returning from my jaunt, I was less than pleased to discover that Marino had taken it upon himself to trade in the hammock for the much more fascinating domain of my private room, where he had ceremoniously dumped every one of my personal possessions onto the floor where he could better examine them piece by piece. I had been somewhat prepared for this jarring sight by reports from other gringos who had made contact with Stone Age Amazon Indian tribes in years past. Apparently, the whole notion of private property is so alien to their culture, they're not the least bit shy to rifle through backpacks and other personal belongings. Clearly, the unabashed native in front of me had no clue that he was doing anything inappropriate. Scattered about him in carefully manicured confusion was everything from my clothes and books to my toothbrush and toilet paper. No knot had been left 
tied, no zipper left zipped, no hidden nook and cranny left unprobed. Of all the hidden treasures that Marino had unearthed, none brought a more beatific smile to his noble savage face than the one he had to search the hardest to find. My baggie of weed, which he was holding up to his nose and sniffing with an exaggerated backward roll of his eyes and lip-smacking grin. Oh, shit. No, no, amigo, I said as casually as I could, gently tugging the baggie from his hand. I gave him a gentle scold, a gently scolding, you've been a naughty boy smile, and stuffed the weed back in my pack. To this day, I don't know whether I ruined the day of a fellow stoner or only confused an Indian that knew he was being excluded from a great gringo secret. To put the incident behind us, I offered him a cheap pocket knife as a consolation prize. I noticed him eyeing my red snakeskin jaguar patterned bell bottom Death Leopard Pants, a former Halloween costume that I had, in fact, hoped to trade with a shaman for an ayahuasca session. I shudder to think of the fashion statement my Stone Age amigo will make in his remote village with those pants. Marino made a play for my Sony Walkman and CD collection, but I simply was not going to suffer the gringo guilt of inflicting that can of worms on his primitive culture. Finally, he bargained for one of my harmonicas. I'm sure my explanation of graduated musical diatonics served only to make me look like an even greedier gringo than I no doubt already looked like. My worldly repossessions resecured in my bag of cannonballs, I distracted Marino with the more mundane task of stoking the fire for dinner. To appease my lingering stoner guilt over not sharing my stash with Marino, I poured an extra stiff glug of rum into his dinnertime piña colada. He was, in fact, half-lit when he disappeared into the headphones of my Walkman for his first taste of the blues guitar wizardry of Eric Clapton. As usual, I took the opportunity to sneak off into <clears throat> off to my less-than-secret stash where I lingered a while to suck down a second bowl. I was stoned out of my gourd by the time I made it back to the Riverview Terrace. By that point, Marino was singing away to Clapton's guitar in his own plaintive Masha Gwenga Indian version of the blues. I closed my eyes and lay back in my hammock, letting the ancient chants, C-H-A-N-T-S, of course, I could not hear Clapton's guitar and the background chorus of crickets carry my cannabis blessed mind back through the centuries, through the millennia, to a time when such voices were the only ones to echo through the jungle night. When the spinning little plastic CD inside the little plastic player attached to little plastic earphones was finished, so was the Stone Age concert. Not wanting the moment to end, I, met, I asked Marino about the flute I had heard him playing the night before. He went to retrieve it from his room, and when he returned, I was surprised to see it was not a flute at all, but a primitive style of tiny violin, which Marino told me was called a pegombi in his native tongue. Constructed from a carefully carved sliver of bamboo, the approximate size and shape of a banana peel, 
the Pagombi had only one string made of some slender jungle vine. The vine was stretched tautly between the tapered ends of the banana peel, creating the effect of a miniature bow and arrow, though the arrow in this case was a sliver of palm frond that acted as the fiddle bow. Of course, I had no clue how this thing was played. I set one lone flickering candle in front of Marino and asked him for a demonstration. He stuck one end of the Pagombi firmly between his lips. He held the other end away from his face with his left hand pressing outward against the string with two of his left fingernails. With his right hand, he gripped the palm frond firmly and placed it on the underside of the string between his fingernails and the corner of his mouth. Quite the tuning up process for such a small, delicate instrument. Tentatively, the seasoned musician began to draw the bow back and forth along the string, and the first tremulous notes began to warble forth into the night. As he moved the bow up and down the string, added or released tension with his fingernails, and moved his cheeks into various positions, the haunting tremolo would rise or fall accordingly. He searched around for a tempo and melody, in essence, a hypnotic chant-like series of six or seven notes that suited his taste, then repeated this musical chant over and over again. I tried to imagine <coughs> what an orchestra of pagombies and animal skin tambores, drums, must sound like around a campfire in his remote village. As he played, Marino's lashless, dark almond eyes assumed a deeply passionate, almost grieving look. His piercing, yet somehow almost blank expression seemed to go right through me, out beyond the porch and the river, penetrating into the depths of the tattered remains is of what is left of his primeval forest home. The music of the Pagombi was every bit as ancient as the sounds of the, of the crickets and the frogs and the distant rush of waterfalls that harmonize with, and for a few glorious minutes, the primitive Indian and the gringo interloper were transported back by the ancient music to as close to the Stone Age as yours truly is ever going to get in the Chainsaw Age. At the end of his performance, Marino smiled modestly, almost humbly. I took advantage of this natural segue to casually ask Marino if he were familiar with ayahuasca. The mere mention of the word lit up his face. Excitedly, he began telling me of his many ventures into the spirit world where he would encounter anacondas, jaguars, and tapirs. He tortured me with tales of scenes that no gringo would ever witness of him and his buddies engaging in an all-night ayahuasca, all ayahuasca sessions where they would beat their tambores and pluck their pigombies and sing their Ikaro chants that would call forth the spirits of the forest. Naturally, I asked for a sample of an ayahuasca-inspired Ikaro, and Marino is only too happy to oblige. Smiling like Buddha, he raised the pagobi to his lips and began picking out a particularly haunting instrumental chant. A couple of minutes into the revelry, he removed the pagobi from his mouth, threw back his head, 
and answered its call with a Mashaguenga chant of his own, I reclined in my hammock, closed my eyes, and let the alternating rhythms of the ancient instrument and even more ancient human voice carry me back once again to the edge of the Stone Age. Even without ayahuasca, I felt I was right on the verge of being wrapped up in the loving coils of the blue anaconda spirit when disaster struck from the highway approximately two city blocks from where we sat some sort of planet some sort of fucking planet eating monstrosity most likely a logging truck blasted its angry horn into the peaceful night air, obliterating Marino's ancient Icaro and yanking us both back from the edge of the Stone Age to the middle of the Chainsaw Age. The sudden interruption to our reveries was no less glaring or blasphemous than ripping a fart during a Chopin sonata. His beautiful song, Destroyed Forever, Marino did the only thing he could do under the circumstances. He burst into a peal of almost joyous laughter at the pure, hilarious absurdity of it all. I stemmed my own rage at my ruined evening by offering to trade one of my harmonicas for Marino's Pagombi, an offer he readily accepted. No doubt he will be honking like Sonny Terry at some ayahuasca fest in his village long before I have learned to play the first note on my new Pagombi. And uh, we will be back to chapter five soon enough.